Good morning. Continuing with our discussion of postmodernism and cinema. So, last time where we stopped, we were talking about how postmodernist cinema happens to have certain features. We talked about Chinese box structure, we talked about pastiche, we talked about fragmented uh, editing techniques. Uh, we were referring to theories of Linda Hutchin, especially with reference to her ideas on pastiche. And we also talked about something called self-referential cinema, where cinema makes commentary on itself. You remember? So, we talked about eight and half, Fellini's eight and half, which is a commentary on the process of making a movie. How many of you have watched eight and half? Are you familiar with that? Good. Wag the dog, Barry Levinson's, where uh, Robert De Niro and Dustin Hoffman play their lead roles. And Dustin Hoffman happens to be a producer who stages a war in order to divert the American public's attention from the fact that the president is having an affair and the elections are round the corner. So, what do they do? So, there are certain spin doctors in the president's office headed by uh, Robert De Niro and they approach a film producer played by Dustin Hoffman and Dustin, is, Dustin Hoffman is asked to give them a solution and he says, if there is no war, let us invent a war and that will distract the public and it does. So, it is a wonderful commentary on the role media plays in forging public opinion. Wag the dog, I strongly recommend the movie, Robert De Niro and Hash Dustin Hoffman. Stardust Memories, Purple Rose of Cairo, both by Woody Allen and also Zelig. Um, and then you have Edward and To Die For. We have already talked about these movies. To Die For is a movie starring Nicole Kidman, who literally we were talking about dies for her 15 minutes of fame. The movie was directed by Gus Von Song. Um, another important feature of postmodern uh, cinema is a hyperlink cinema. We were, the other way we were talking about hyperlink cinema, we talked about Babel, remember? And we also talked about uh, Requiem for a Dream. So, hyperlink cinema, uh, is a term coined by Elisa Quart for films which are multilinear in a metaphorical sense and Pulp Fiction tops the list. While talking about genre bending, we were discussing the other day uh, how Pulp Fiction is a landmark movie in the way the narrative is constructed. Other examples of uh, hyperlink cinema could be adaptation. Sliding Doors, Suriana, you were already mentioning Crash, I would also like to add 21 Grams and City of God. I am very sure most of these films are familiar to you. Of late, we have been having uh, the phenomenon of anthology movies. Well, this is nothing new. It has always been in existence, uh, a couple of directors coming together and making short films, but it has become more fashionable in recent times. So, you have a number of big time filmmakers coming together and directing films. Coffee and Cigarettes is an ex excellent example of uh, short movies, uh, 10 minutes or so, each movie run, the running length of each movie would be 10 minutes or so. Uh, it's but all movies are directed by Jim Jarmusch, hmm, who is an independent filmmaker, also known by, for uh, Johnny Depp is starring Dead Man. You must watch Dead Man, especially for its music. It has excellent rock music. Uh, Parijatem, that is Paris I Love You, is an anthology of uh, movies by several directors. Okay? And all movies are centered on the city of Paris. And here, Paris is not just the glamorous city okay, or uh, the way we use city, uh, see Paris in uh, uh, Midnight in Paris, in Woody Allen's Paris. It's not that kind of Paris. Uh, you, in this city, you have racial tensions. In this Paris, you have poverty, you have alienation, you have loneliness. So, it's that kind, but it's still Paris, I love you, and directed by different directors. Okay, different from Coffee and Cigarettes, because in Coffee and Cigarettes, 
which is the space? A restaurant. Every all conversations are taking place in a restaurant over coffee and cigarettes, literally. So, therefore, the title. Paris, I love you, I love you, Paris, in spite of all your weaknesses and faults, that is the idea. New York, I love you, continuation, it is not as forceful as Paris, I love you, but it's still it has a number of big time filmmakers directing films set in a short film set in New York. Uh, Shekhar Kapoor is one of the directors. Uh, Tokyo Stories and Toronto Stories. Toronto Stories is uh, completely set as uh, the title suggests in Toronto and Tokyo Stories in Tokyo. So, uh, why are, you know we call these films, we have another title for these kinds of films. Do you know? Paris, New York, Toronto, Tokyo, City Symphony. Okay, so, these movies are also giving you a glimpse of city in its various manifestations. Hmm? So, uh, and very postmodern is because they give you fragmented glimpse, vignettes of something. Yeah? Coffee and cigarettes. So, a restaurant is not the focus, but the conversation, the kind of people you find. So, this is, you know, as uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald rightly points out in The Great Gatsby, the inexhaustible variety of human beings. This is what he is interested in, inexhaustible variety of human beings. So, in Coffee and Cigarettes, uh, the director is interested in the kind of people you find, all kinds of people around us, that is the idea. So, very postmodernist, very fragmented, because it is not a linear uh, kind, traditional kind of a story hmm? and they are not linked at all. They know absolutely no link between people in all these films. Any comments Rehan about to say? The New York stories that you remember? Three movies I keep on referring to the New York, Scorsese, Woody Allen, Coppola, hmm? all these children of New Hollywood's movement and then uh, they come together. All these movies are set in the city of New York. So, wonderful movies, but not as short as you find in Pari, uh, Jatem and Coffee and Cigarettes. Each movie runs into some 40 to 45 minutes. Now, I am going to discuss, uh, now the key text for today's class is John Woo's Face Off. Anyone here? who is not familiar with this very popular movie. I can see lot of smiles. How kind of you and how fortunate for me. Okay. So, John Woo directed this movie and uh, let me point your at, uh, attention towards the poster. Do you find anything uh, unique about the poster of this movie? This was the way the movie was released. Is it one face or two different faces? Two different faces, but how are they joined? How are they joined? Their eyes become one, right? There are two, actually the, these are fragments of two faces and they are joined together. Okay, and whose faces are these? Travolta and Cage. Yeah, and, uh, one eye belongs to Nicolas Cage and one eye to John Travolta. But the faces are so joined that it almost looks it is one face and having a common pair of eyes. Why do we need to have this kind of uh, poster for a movie like Face Off? And Face Off, we, we, if you have watched the movie, you know there is a literal meaning to it. Yeah, literally ripping somebody's face off. Hmm? But then, Avedanta, have you seen the movie? Oh, you must watch it. Okay, it is very postmodern, is therefore we are going to discuss it. But um, face slash off, uh, there is uh, another meaning to it. What is it? We often use the word Mexican face off. Hmm? Yeah, confrontation between two people. You know. That is a typical signature style in most Tarantino movies and most John Woo movies. People just pointing guns towards each other's 
come you know headlong confrontation. So, that is it and that is the basic theme of the movie. Nicholas Cage and John Travolta having a headlong confrontation and swapping identities not by choice, but forced by circumstances. Yeah. And then how swapping faces and swapping identities lead uh, to the narrative, what kind of narrative emerges out of the swapping of it. So, it is a very good uh, uh, example of a postmodernist film, because we talk about fragmented identities, fractured narratives hmm, and all these features are present in face off. So, uh, face off basically a very glossy, ve visually very compelling movie directed by the Hong Kong um, superstar director John Woo. Are you familiar with other movies by John Woo? The Killer, A Better Tomorrow, yeah, it is one of his uh, well known Chinese films, you know, Hong Kong martial art movie, but he is not a typical um, wired kind action director kind of a, it is more like a psychological conflict also. So, face off has lot of psychological conflict. So, the movie talks about blurred identities and that is what you find in the poster also. And uh, um, uh, one key feature of the film is the way it represents masculinity uh, as the self conscious acting out of gender roles. Um, John Woo happens to be a very hyper masculine kind of a director. All his films have a strong code of masculine conduct. Yesterday, we were talking about um, how Tarantino is uh, influenced by the cinema of Sam Peckinpah and Brian De Palma and those directors were known for their strong masculine codes and so is John Woo. Okay, so, if you watch the movie Face Off, you will understand uh, both these men have a peculiar code of conduct how to be a father, how to be a lover, how to be a husband, how to be a professional. Men on a mission, they have a personal code, they have a professional code, they have a, they have certain ethics of behaving with certain people. So, those codes are important in all John Woo movies and come across very strongly in face off. So, um, the credit sequence itself, how, uh, you have watched the movie recently Siddharth, how does it begin? I think the Nicholas Cage scene, right? It, mm, begins, it begins with the Nicholas Cage scene. You also have John Travolta playing a detective. yeah, a detective, an FBI cop, an agent, uh, who is out to get Nicholas Cage, who is a dreaded criminal. Hmm? And yes, and then there is a scene where uh, mm, it's a merry-go-round scene where the yes, is short. where John Travolta's son is shot dead by Nicholas Cage. Of course, he meant to kill John Travolta, not the kid and after, subsequently John Travolta makes it a personal mission to catch Nicholas Cage. And uh, the merry-go-round scene evokes nostalgic memories of Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train, because that is the way Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. Uh, the, the climax of the movie is shot hmm? and that too is a movie about a face off between two men. That too hints at swapping identities, not literally face uh, swapping faces, but identities. Okay, strangers are, are on a train. If you watch these two movies back to back, you will understand that his, how important uh, Hitchcock's influence is on this movie thematically. So, there is an intertextual reference. Now, I quote Fred, Frederick Jameson here, where he sees the reliance on the styles of the past as an indication of the particular kind of nostalgia that is one of the defining characteristics <laughs> of postmodern art. So, nostalgia happens to be a very important part of all postmodern art. Okay, and this feature is seen very clearly in John Woo's face off. And uh, Frederick Jameson also uses a term called 
random cannibalization of all the styles of the past, where uh, the past is reduced to a series of spectacles. So, Hitchcock's memorable scene is, um, if you quote or apply Frederick Jameson in John Wu's hands, it becomes like a random <laughs> cannibalization, but now it is up to you to decide whether it is or whether he make, he, it, it, it is an integral part, it is an integral uh, intertextuality happening there. So, this is what Frederick Jameson says in postmodernism or the cultural logic of the late capitalism. I think I have been referring to this work quite often. This could be your, you know, one of your theoretical discussions. Uh, Jameson also says, and in this is another work, Postmodernism and Consumer Society, uh, where he talks about psychic fragmentation or schizophrenia of the postmodern life. Do take down these notes, uh, where he says, ex as experience of the isolated, disconnected, discontinuous material signifiers into uh, which fail to link into a coherent sequence. The schizophrenic does not know personal identity in our sense, a schizoid, a fragmented personality. So, you, you, the person is not aware that there are two sides, very opposing, very contradictory sides to his own personality. Uh, do you know that face off was adapted, not exactly or not literally, but there was an adaptation in Hindi. Which movie was that? Are you aware of it? It was a very well known movie, much hyped, did not do too well commercially, but for those times it was extremely well publicized. Uh, much hyped movie called Ax. It was uh, the first movie directed by Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra, starring Amitabh Bachchan and Manoj Bajpai, where uh, they had given a touch of Indian uh, philosophy and a spiritual element to the swapping, to the idea of swapping of identities. Now, see example of pastish in face off. So, uh, music is seen as a pastish, you know, it, it is a combination of several kinds of movies. And uh, remember, we were talking about high bro culture, low bro culture. So, you have uh, Handel's Hallelujah at one point, Nicolas Cage, of all the people, he personifies evil and he is in, uh, he is in a church, just uh, almost making a spoof of a very holy song. Hmm? At the same time, you have plenty of rock music throughout the movie. And then you have another very uh, uh, memorable scene, which is a shootout scene. People are shooting all over the place. And then um, Nicolas Cage, he does not want his son to get exposed to that kind of violence. So, what does he do? No, no, he, he makes, song. yeah, he yeah, makes him wear a headphone <laughs> and the song which is playing is somewhere over the rainbow, that is Judy Garland from Wizard of Oz. So, it is totally contradictory to whatever is happening outside, around the child. Child is, a, a child watches the scene, bullets uh, going all over the place and people running and chasing each other, hitting each other, but he does not hear those sounds, because his father has put that uh, melodious, beautiful music on him. Okay, so, that is, and this is nothing new, this is a very common device, uh, having a background music, which is completely opposite to whatever is happening on screen. I can, how many of you are aware of Anurag Kashyap's Vijay uh, Namvyar that directed the movie Shaitan? I watched the movie. There is a scene where the, these youngsters, they are running all over the chawls of Dharavi and uh, they are clad in burqa, which make them uh, looks very, look very ridiculous. Yeah. And which is the song playing in the background? It is a shootout scene, police is chasing them. Khoya Khoya Chand remixed. Khoya Khoya Chand, which is originally a song, a very beautiful, melodious 
something like somewhere over the rainbow kind of song sung by Muhammad Rafi. Hmm? Uh, Devanand performed to that uh, song uh, maybe during the 50s or the early 60s. But now having a song like that for a shootout scene, what does it? It's a very postmodernist device. Many a time we do not pay attention to these things, but if you look at it deeply, yes, the filmmaker has done lot of thinking about giving the right kind, the very appropriate kind of background music to the situation. Otherwise, what kind of background music would you expect in a shootout scene? The bang bang music you know, or maybe very fast paced music, but imagine somewhere over the rainbow or khoya khoya chand. Okay, for a scene which is extremely violent, hyperkinetic, but then you have a song like that as in the background. Okay, so a very strong, uh, very forceful postmodernist device. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the idea of having a doppelganger or your other, your double, is very intriguing, and this is another integral part of postmodern narratives to have another identity and having a literal other. So, Sean Archer and Castor Pollux, Sean Archer is John Travolta, Castor Pollux is Nicholas Cage and both these men have a son each. Okay, so, uh, they are quite alike in the way they behave, in the way they uh, take their duties and their professions very seriously. It is almost like having your double out there. And there is a scene where uh, Castor Pollux uh, offers paternal advice to uh, Sean Archer's daughter, how to save herself, gives her a knife from a potential molester. That is a very interesting scene. Now, uh, nostalgia, we were talking the idea of nostalgia and how it informs postmodern narratives. So, Cage's transformation into Archer, uh, so Nicholas Cage becomes Sean Archer. Who is Sean Archer basically? Originally John Travolta. But now, now what, what is, if you have watched Nicholas Cage, he happens to be a very intense actor, hmm? very intense and there is hardly a funny bone in him. On the other hand, John Travolta is hardly the hyper-masculine guy he is forced to act out. So, he is not, he is the eternal cool. I mean, you watch him in Pulp Fiction, yeah. he is what we call a typical cool dude. That is the kind of actor John Travolta is and there is always certain kind of an ambiguity about him. Yeah. He is not that in your face macho hyper-masculine actor at all, whereas Nicolas Cage is. And we have seen him performing very intense, very dramatic roles, roles which John Travolta will never be known for, not no intensity or uh, and no uh, dramatic intensity for John Travolta. But then, uh, when John Travolta assumes the identity of Nicolas Cage, we are taken back to Con Air, yeah, the hero in distress, Moonstruck, a romantic hero the intense hero, the suffering, the complex hero. Okay. All these attributes you can never associate with John Travolta. John Travolta when he turns, uh, Nicholas Cage when he turns into John Travolta. Now, John Travolta is known for certain things and one is his coolness okay, and that comes through. And suddenly we find now Nicholas Cage acting the way, because in our, at the back of your mind you know this is Nicholas Cage, he is just wearing John Travolta's face, but then he assumes Travolta's identity, right? And then you see him doing the same, the same walk, the same talk okay, that Travolta is so loved for. And we know, it evokes the memories of Pulp Fiction, we have just seen him in Pulp Fiction. We remember him for Grease and Saturday Night Fever. We know that he, John Travolta is the ultimate in Uber Cool and that is the persona that comes across. 
So, trademark styles of performance. Having talked about uh, this film, we will we'll talk up, we will refer to another movie which came a little before uh, face off Natural Born Killers, Oliver Stones. And then we will see how this movie satisfies many postmodernist conditions. So, what is it about? It is about uh, uh, again Bonnie and Clyde story redone, serial killers on the run as played by Juliet Lewis and Woody Harrelson.